So today we're going to continue our unit on evolution and we're actually going to move away from the evolution of the individual cell and how cells started as simple prokaryotic cells and how now they've become these more complex eukaryotic cells. That's what we talked about last time. This time we're actually going to think, start thinking about the theory of evolution. How does evolution really occur within these populations and throughout these generations, throughout time? How does this change really occur throughout time? So we're on section 4.1b, and we're actually on page 77 of our notes. So when we're talking about the theory of evolution, we do have to first mention Charles Darwin, who's known as the father of evolution. Okay. He actually um, studied things like finches, which were types of birds, and tortoises in his travels. He traveled a lot and was able to observe that even though we have this one type of bird, within this one type of bird, we had lots and lots of differences. So the main thing that we need to talk about here or really understand in this section is natural selection, okay? Natural selection is the idea that organisms from a population, so one organism from a population, um, can be selected for to survive because they are best adapted to the current environment. What does that mean? That means that one organism, one living thing, can have a specific trait that allows it to survive better at this, at this particular time. So maybe one year there was a little puppy dog and the puppy dog grew a lot more fur than the rest of the puppies that it was born with. Well, if it ends up being a really, really cold winter, then that puppy dog that has a lot more fur than the others, just by chance, just by the genetics, the genes he received, then he's going to survive and be able to pass on his gene. Now, natural selection can eventually lead to new species being created, and that's called speciation. So we're saying, okay, there's a trait that allows you to survive better, and eventually it can occur over and over and over again in a way that you become very different from what started and possibly producing generations later a new species. And so we'll talk about that a little more later on, but right now we're going to focus on this process of natural selection. Um, here we do see some pictures of Darwin's finches, some of the birds that he observed, and we will actually talk about this in more detail later on in class. But natural selection is a process, so you'll want to write that down. And here are the four steps to this process. The first is variation, meaning that the members of the population are genetically different, have different traits, different alleles, and therefore have different phenotypes. When you're thinking about this variation, let's also think about how this relates to Unit 3. How does this relate to the DNA, the protein synthesis? How does this relate to the genetics, the Punnett squares that we did? The second step of the process is overpopulation. This really means that more members of the population exist than the carrying capacity can support. Carrying capacity is referring to how much food there is, how much space there is, how much land there is, how much resources do we have to support the individuals living in that environment. And in a lot of cases, we're going to have more than necessary because what usually happens? Well, some of them die, right? Three is going to be competition. So now you're fighting for these resources because they are limited. And so this is going to favor the best suited phenotype at that particular time. Being the most fit isn't always going to mean that you're the biggest, baddest, toughest one out there, but it could mean that you're the smallest, fastest one. It could mean that you're the furriest one. It could mean that you're simply a different color than what is seen there. So in this picture up here, we have some birds eating some beetles. Well, the green beetles really pop out to the birds, so they're all eating green beetles. But here we have three kind of brown beetles that are able to hide in the background. And so 
they actually can camouflage and they can survive. They are the best suited phenotype for that time. What, what does that mean for them? That means that those brown beetles survive, survive because they're the best adapted and they are successful because they are able to pass on their genes in reproduction. So make sure you carefully copy down each of these factors or steps of the process because you will be referring back to this a lot in this unit. Um, and here's just a little comic for you with some beavers, so if you want to take a second to read over that. But here again, we're showing you another idea that these mutations cause, create variation. Here we have some um, sort of organism having three different colors, started off as color, now we produce, because of the mutation, a lighter colored one and a darker colored one. Notice that they actually cross out the white one over here, meaning this organism, maybe white fur, wasn't the best adaptation for this environment. So this organism died. And eventually notice how this environment is actually favoring this darker colored fur. And eventually the medium colored fur ones start to die as well. And so in this situation, they're showing that these darker colored fur, or whatever it is, is a lot more favorable than lighter. And eventually you move towards having just these darker fur organisms. That's an example of an adaptation. An adaptation is something that you inherit. It's really, really important that you know that this is something that's inherited. Okay. An adaptation is not something that you can go and get. So it's not that you adapted because you went to, um, you lost your leg and now you got a fake leg. Okay, maybe you got an extra leg. And so an adaptation isn't something that you can develop over your lifetime. It has to be something that you're born with. Um, unlike a butterfly, a caterpillar to a butterfly, that's an adaptation, moving from something that is moving on land to something that can fly in the air. That's an adaptation. But if you suddenly were able to build wings for yourself and fly, that's not an adaptation. Um, and the main thing with adaptations is that you're going to survive your environment and mate. In evolution, in natural selection, the important thing is that you're able to pass on your genes. Because if you don't pass on your genes, then it doesn't really matter what you did. Okay? So when we're looking at adaptations, there are three different kinds that we'll need to talk about. The first is structural, so that's something physical on your body. Some examples of that could be the shape of a bird's beak, which we'll look at with Darwin's finches, or even mimicry. Mimicry is similarities of one species to another, which protects one of them or both of them. Examples of that right here in this picture is actually a stick bug. Okay, the bug looks like the stick. And so what's the benefit for him? Then we also have a king cobra and a coral snake. Does anyone know the difference between these? Do you guys know which one's poisonous and which one's not? Okay, because one of them's poisonous, but the other isn't. And so it's just mimicking or copying how the other one looks. Why does it want to do that? Um, another, the two other adaptations that we need to know about are behavioral adaptations. Some of these are genetic traits. Sometimes some behaviors, especially in wild animals, are genetic. That could be like herding, okay? Um, antelope kind of running together. It could be like our school of fish. It could be growling. Those are all genetic things. They automatically know how to do that. Then there are also physiological adaptations, and that's going to be a body process. An example there is oxygen binding to hemoglobin in your red blood cells. Your red blood cells being able to carry oxygen around your body is an adaptation. Not every organism has blood the way we do, and not every organism has blood that can carry oxygen the way we do. And then in this last little section for today's notes, we're going to look at evidence for evolution. The first evidence for evolution are fossils. 
and this is any evidence of life that once existed on Earth. That could be bones, footprints, and you can actually find a pattern of evolution over time based on those fossils. So here you have something that was an ancestor to a horse, and you're actually seeing fossils of its leg bone and how that has evolved or changed over time. With fossils, there's actually two ways to date fossils. The first is relative dating, and there you're just looking at the order of appearance in sedimentary rock. Remember, sedimentary rock is rock layers that literally layer on top of each other. So in the picture that you have, yours is a little different from mine, which one's older, which one's younger? Is the one on top younger, or is the one on bottom younger? Well, in this case, and you'll want to write this in your notes, that you're older at the bottom, and you're maybe writing this right over your picture, and younger at the top. We also have radioactive dating, and that's using isotopes, which are really elements, to date an organism. How old is it based on its state? So that's carbon dating, and a lot of people have probably heard of that. Then there's two more types of evidence. The second one is biochemical similarities. This is when you're comparing DNA, RNA, or amino acid sequences. The more similar your DNA is, that's going to mean the more similar your amino acids are, your proteins are. The more similarities you have, the more closely you are related. So here we're looking at five different species. You have your humans. Um, look at the humans and try to figure out, put a star by the humans, and put a star by which one it is most closely related to. You're just looking down the column, looking at the first, second, third, and fourth amino acid, okay? So with humans, who are we most closely related to? We're actually going to be most closely related to the chimpanzee. Notice that these four amino acids here are very, very similar. Then the last type of evidence is going to be anatomical structures, and these are just body structures or physical structures. Um, there's three types of anatomical structures you need to know about. The first is a homologous structure. You don't want to write a number one by this because you can't see this that well, or actually a letter A would work as well. Homologous structures are the same structure, but they have a different function. So they're shaped the same, like this human's arm, a whale's fin, dog's leg, and back. The way the bones are set up are actually really, really similar. But they all do different things. Um, another type of anatomical structure, the second kind, is called an analogous structure, which means you have the same function. All of these things here help the organism fly, but they're structured or made a different way. This is not all foam. Okay, this is not all made of the same material. And then the last thing in this section of notes are vestigial structures. And vestigial structures really serve no purpose in your body, except that they were left behind by a previous ancestor. So things like our wisdom teeth and our tailbone, those are things that are considered vestigial structures. We don't use them anymore. And if anything, something like our wisdom teeth actually bother us a lot of the time. But they used to be used for something, okay? And so now they're just left behind. Um, make sure you have all of the notes for today and we'll continue next time with mechanisms for evolution.